So what is this image? It is pre-auricular tag because the caption of the video is pre-auricular sinus. This image is not pre-auricular sinus. This is pre-auricular tag. This is pre-auricular sinus. So what is pre-auricular sinus? It is a congenital anomaly. It is seen as a small pit or del anterior to the ascending limb of the helix. How does it develop? To know how it develops, you should know the development of the external ear. So the external ear developed from the pharyngeal arches, from the first and the second pharyngeal arches. So there are tubercles occurring on the first and second pharyngeal arches. Three tubercles arise from the first pharyngeal arch. That is three tubercles arise from the caudal border, that is inferior border of the first pharyngeal arch. And three tubercles arise from the uh, cephalic border, that is uh, cephalic means head. So the superior border of the second pharyngeal arch. And these six tubercles are known as hillocks of his. These merge together forming the external ear. So, the most commonly accepted theory for development of preauricular sinuses, there is inadequate fusion of these uh, hillocks of his. The sinuses form near the tragus because there is uh, inadequate fusion between the first and the second pharyngeal arches because the tragus and part of the helix is formed from the first arch. Remaining everything is formed from the second pharyngeal arch. So, majority of the external ear is formed in the second pharyngeal arch. There are other theories also like ectodermal infolding theory uh, that is not uh, accepted now. And also some believe that the preauricular sinus are part of uh, branchiogenic malformations. Branchiogenic malformations occur because of the incomplete uh, closure of the dorsal part of the first pharyngeal group. But we have to differentiate preauricular sinus from branchial cleft anomalies. Because branchial cleft anomalies are related to the tympanic membrane, external ear canal, but preauricular sinuses are always superficial and they do not go beyond the temporal fascia. They do not involve the external artery canal, external artery meatus, tympanic membrane, or the angle of mandible. But branchial cleft anomalies do involve them. Also, the preauricular sinus do not involve the facial nerve. We see a pit or dell outside, but there is a track that continues inside in a tortuous way. And the track will uh, get attached to the perichondrium of the auricle. So this track always follows uh, superior and lateral to the facial nerve. And this usually do not involve the parotid gland also. Usually the preauricular sinus is sporadic. Uh, there are inherited forms. Inherited forms can be bilateral also. When a preauricular sinus is inherited, it follows a uh, incomplete autosomal dominant pattern. A preauricular sinus can be associated with other syndromes also in the body, other anomalies in the body. The most common associated one is branchio-autorenal spectrum disorder. This contains everything, branchio-autorenal syndrome, branchio-autourotic syndrome, branchio-autic syndrome, all this comes under this branchio-autorenal spectrum disorder. That is, you have preauricular sinus, branchial cleft anomalies like lateral cervical cleft and renal anomalies like uh, bifid, renal pelvis, uh, congenital kidney disease. There can be bifid ureters, ureteric anomalies. All this can occur in patients with preauricular sinus. Bilateral preauricular sinus are also seen in trisomy 22. Other syndromes that are associated with preauricular sinus are cat eye syndrome, becute Wiedemann syndrome. So, where is the location of the preauricular sinus? The most common location of the preauricular sinus is here, that is the anterior margin of the ascending limb of helix. So that is the most common location. That is known as the classic preauricular sinus. So the preauricular sinus can have a sinus tract that goes tortuously and attaches to the auricle or due to secretion buildup or something, there can be a preauricular cyst development. Imagine a line that is drawn from the tragus along the posterior margin of the helix. If you draw a line, pit or preauricular sinus seen anterior to this line is known as a classic preauricular sinus. That is the most common type of preauricular sinus. Any preauricular sinus pit del occurring seen Posterior to this imaginary line is known as variant preauricular sinus. There are different types of variant preauricular sinus. So it can occur along the crust of helix, posterior margin of the simba conga, lobule, post-auricular, supra-auricular, etc. All these are variant preauricular sinus. Preauricular sinus tracts do not involve the facial nerve. It goes uh, superior and lateral to the facial nerve. Thus, we can differentiate preauricular sinus tract from a branchial cleft anomaly. So what is the presentation? 
the most common presentation is asymptomatic on a routine examination the ent surgeon identifies a preauricular del or pit is there and presentation is patient comes from a discharge from the preauricular pit or del so the discharge is coming out the discharge can be due to uh, the secretions from the cells that is coming out or it can be an infected preauricular sinus with pus vista the patient can also present with an infected preauricular cyst with pain around the ears and also if the infection is more severe the patient can present with a preauricular abscess formation how do you investigate a patient with preauricular sinus so if a patient is having just an asymptomatic preauricular sinus not much investigation is required if it is unilateral asymptomatic just tell the patient that he is having a congenital anomaly and be careful about it um, that he has to follow proper hygiene any dandruff or skin infection can cause the infection of the preauricular sinus a few of these cases can have a deafness associated conductive sensory neural or mixed deafness so if it is unilateral sporadic mostly the patient will be having a normal hearing you can do a clinical testing of the hearing and if it is normal you can reassess the patient or you can do a puerton audiogram but if the patient is having any other anomalies any uh, malformations of the auricle or any other facial malformations or if the patient is having a history of deafness or ear malformations in the family or there is history of maternal diabetes you have to do a puerton audiometry and you have to do a renal ultrasound this is actually a criteria for abdominal ultrasound so that is known as vans criteria if the history of mother having diabetes history of family history of deafness and any other malformations we you have to go for a abdomen ultrasound to rule out any renal anomaly if there is any pus discharge from the preauricular sinus opening you can take a swab for culture and sensitivity to identify the organism and the antimicrobial susceptibility a general blood investigation can also be done to assess the blood counts and everything what is the treatment an asymptomatic preauricular sinus does not require any treatment so when it is infected you can give topical and oral antibiotics usual organism is our common common cells staph aureus streptococcus so usual mox clav and uh, tikibacter or mupirocin local topical ointments will help control the infection you can give anti inflammatory drugs also then once the infection is controlled you can counsel the patient for surgery if an abscess is formed if you can do an ind but before doing a traditional ind you can try with a lacrimal probe you can insert a lacrimal probe the blunt end into the preauricular sinus opening and widen it so that the pus will drain via the opening itself the advantage of trying this technique is if you do a traditional ind it can cause severe scarring and when you have to take up the patient for a sinusectomy at a later stage it can become a difficult surgery you can try to remove the pus using a lacrimal probe and if it is not getting improved you can go for a traditional ind if there is recurrent pus discharge recurrent infection the treatment is surgical treatment that is complete removal of the sinus so the sinusectomy surgery is done during a cuisson phase we do not do a surgery when it is acutely inflamed or when an abscess is present so what is the surgery performed the surgery performed traditionally is sinusectomy that is excision of the preauricular sinus it can be done under general anesthesia or local anesthesia in children we prefer general anesthesia in adult it can be done under local anesthesia with infiltration of 2% lignocaine after the after the anesthesia whatever it is the ear local you can insert a small probe or a scalp vein cannula into the opening and inject methylene blue or gentian violet you can use methylene blue so that the entire tract will be stained and it will be easy to identify during the dissection some surgeons some centers prefer to inject the dye in the previous day itself so that the dye will be inside the preauricular sinus tract and it will stain the tract if you are not staining it the tract will be seen as a glistening white material will be seen as the tract the tract will be glistening white in color so what you do is you do an elliptical incision so if this is the pit you do an elliptical incision and then dissect the, uh, the subcutaneous tissue to identify the tract you have to follow the tract dissect the tract and follow the tract uh, carefully and you have to also check for any uh, divergent tracts sometimes there can be two three tracts that come together and then form a single tract all that has to be identified and you have to reach the attachment of the tract to the auricular perichondrium so that perichondrium along with a small piece of auricular cartilage is excised so that recurrence is prevented and then the wound is sutured in layers and the tract can be sent for a histopathological examination this is the most commonly done technique always know that the medial limit of dissection is temporalis fascia we should not dissect beyond the temporalis fascia 
Then another technique is also there known as Jensma technique. Uh, in this technique, what they do is the incision is the same. What they do is they do an inside out dissection. That is, uh, they put the elliptical incision, then lift the flap up. Lift that skin flap up and dissect from inside to outside. Some surgeons say that in this case, there is uh, more, e it is easier to identify the tract and there is less chance of missing the tract. This is also a variation of the sinusectomy technique. There is another procedure known as supraauricular excision. This is a little bit radical procedure. It is done for patients with recurrent repeated infections and scarring and the normal anatomy will be quite distorted with recurrent infections. So what you do is you put the elliptical incision and extend the incision supraauricular, supraauricular extension of the incision and we have to dissect till the temporalis fascia. Always keep in mind the temporalis fascia is the medial limit of dissection and we remove all the tissues between the sinus and the temporalis fascia along with the sinus tract and a part of perichondrium and auricular cartilage. This is known as uh, supraauricular excision of the preauricular sinus, a dead space will be created. You can either keep gel form or you can suture it and keep a uh, drain. So these cases also will heal very well. The most common uh, problem encountered with preauricular sinus surgery is recurrence. The recurrence rate is classified as 1 to 45 percent. Many studies uh, say that poor surgical technique is the most common cause of recurrence. So to summarize, preauricular sinus, its most common location is anterior to the ascending limb of the helix and it is formed due to incomplete fusion of the hillocks of his. Most common is asymptomatic. Patient can develop infection, pus discharge, abscess, preauricular cysts. Treatment is once the signs of inflammation subsides, patient can be taken for excision.